Before we begin, we wanted to let you know that you can subscribe to the New Scientist app and website from just £16.25 or $28 with a digital subscription. As a digital subscriber, you'll get unlimited access to over 50 new articles a week on newscientist.com, plus unrestricted access to the New Scientist app, plus lots of other perks too, like free online events, free accredited courses from New Scientist Academy, and a weekly subscriber-only newsletter from New Scientist's editor-in-chief. To find out more, visit newscientist.com slash febsale2023. That's febsale, F-E-B-S-A-L-E, 2023. Hello and welcome to New Scientist Weekly, the science podcast that feeds your curiosity. I'm your host, Penny Sarche. And I'm Timothy Revel. This week, we've got an amazing show for you. We've got what entropy tells us about consciousness, and we're solving the mystery of ripples on the sun. We're also looking at how the race over artificially intelligent chat models is hotting up. There are concerns about bird flu crossing over into mammals. Plus, we've also got some rarely heard noises from the Arctic and the Antarctic. To talk about all that, we're joined by New Scientist journalists Madeline Cuff, Carmela Padovich callahan and Matthew Sparks. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Okay, so let's start this week then with bird flu. As we've covered on the podcast before, the world is still in the grip of an avian flu epidemic that has just been devastating for bird populations. And now there are increasing concerns over infections cropping up in mammals. Maddie, can you give us a picture of the impact of this epidemic so far? Yeah, so I mean, frankly, it's been pretty awful since this current epidemic started in about October 2021. There have been 15 million domestic birds culled in the UK and globally more than 193 million have been culled to stop the virus spreading. And, you know, it's easier to count the number of farmed birds that have been culled, but that's not really including the number of wild birds that have been infected. And there's evidence to suggest that it's having potentially catastrophic impacts on wild bird populations, particularly seabirds. So all of that is awful and, and of real concern. But of course, another worry is that it might at some point jump over into humans and, and cause problems for us, which is why recent reports of mammal infections are quite concerning. It is a bit worrying. We're now seeing um, increasing evidence of mammals becoming infected with avian flu. So we've had outbreaks being reported in mink farms, in seals, in sea lions, in otters, foxes, and even grizzly bears. So in the UK, there have been 49 mammal carcasses infected with bird flu collected um, in 2021. That jumped to 119 in 2022. And so far this year, at least four have been collected and counting. And that's really only likely to be a small snapshot because underreporting is a big issue here. Um, and the UK's Health Security Agency has warned that there is, quote, very limited surveillance of mammals to monitor the spillover risk across the UK. And it's a problem that applies worldwide. So we really don't know for sure how many mammals are getting infected with this virus. Yeah, that, that uncertainty is a, is a big potential problem. How, how worried should we be about the virus infecting mammals? It is worrying because we need to know how this virus is getting into mammals and crucially whether it is passing between mammals because that could then pose a threat to people. So at the moment you can as a human get infected by bird flu which is H5N1 virus but you have to be in really close contact with an infected bird for it to happen but obviously if the virus can start jumping from mammal to mammal that that risk might become greater. Yeah. Is there evidence that that's happening yet, that mammals are catching it from each other rather than from birds? The short answer is we, we don't know yet. Most authorities are currently saying that these mammals that are testing positive for avian flu, they're getting sick because they're eating or coming into contact with infected birds. And because there are so many infected birds at the moment out in the wild, this epidemic has been so bad that there's just more chances for mammals to become infected by them. But there is one particularly troubling case. It was this mink farm in um, in the Galicia region in Spain. And so last October, the bird flu virus there spread over the whole premises of the farm, which might suggest that the virus could have been traveling from mink to mink. But that's not completely clear cut. I was speaking to um, an avian flu expert called Munir Iqbal at the Purbright Institute in the UK. And he said that the virus in the mink farm could have been spread by a contaminated water source or contaminated feed. So we're still not completely clear on whether we are dealing with mammal to mammal transmission. And that's really what scientists are racing to find out. Now, 
we've spoken before about ChatGPT, an AI with an impressive ability to write poetry, help kids cheat on their homework, and provide written answers to almost any question. Yeah, that's right. And um, this week we've heard about two new AI models designed to do quite similar things. So Matt, what's going on? Uh, so the, the firm OpenAI has been getting a lot of attention for its ChatGPT model. And uh, Google and Baidu, which is sometimes known as the Chinese Google, they've, they've obviously been watching as closely as anyone because they've both developed their own similar models now. Google's is called Bard and Baidu's is called Ernie. And uh, each company said that they intend to sort of plug them into their respective search engines so that users can get a bespoke written response to their query rather than just getting a, a list of relevant websites. Now, one of the things that's been missing from all these natural language AI models is a, is a route to profit for the firms that develop them. And I think that's what we're starting to see tested out now. It's so funny they're called Bard and Ernie. It's so close to being a Sesame Street thing. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know who names these things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, is it just a coincidence that Google and Baidu have released the details of their AIs of Bard and Ernie at the same time? Or did something happen to sort of force this? Well, it could be because last week we got a, a little glimpse into plans by Microsoft, which already had a, a stake in OpenAI and invested another $10 billion earlier this year to do a similar thing with ChatGPT. We saw some Bing search users. They are they are out there. There's not many of them, but they were shown a new feature where AI answered their questions and screenshots of this sort of got shared around and, and the, the feature quickly got pulled again. And it seems like perhaps this lit a bit of a fire under Google and Baidu to announce their own plans before Microsoft got the chance. But uh, then Microsoft swooped in again this week and they formally launched theirs before anyone else had to. So it's, it's all turned into a bit of an arms race. It's all coming at once. One thing that sort of puzzles me, Matt, is why people think AI will be better than normal search engines. I, I think I'd much rather, at the moment anyway, that a search pulled up a relevant snippet written by an expert human than an AI answer kind of algorithmically taking a stab at the right answer. Well, I, I think the idea is that AI can take a, a complex question and it can give you a bespoke answer. So Google's CEO, he, he said that People used to ask questions like, how many keys does a piano have? Which is you know, quite straightforward. There's a definite answer. But increasingly, they're putting in questions to Google like, uh, is the piano or guitar easier to learn? And how much do you need to practice for each one? If you ask a question like that, you'll get, uh, you'll get some results that will help, some web website results that will help. But Google's betting that Bard will be able to pull together a sort of comprehensive and customized response that will, that will be more satisfying for the user. And perhaps the, the bigger benefit is they can do all that while keeping the user on their website where they can monetize them rather than sending them off elsewhere reading one of the search results. Yeah. So are these new models, is it good news? This is the direction we seem to be going in or is there a downside? It's potentially good news if they, if they are useful. But one concern is whether AI models can really provide good search answers they're designed to create statistically likely or convincingly real seeming output, but it still remains to be seen whether they can actually provide a level of sort of factual correctness that you'd hope for from a search engine. We just wanted to take a quick break to tell you that there are a few places left on the New Scientist Discovery Tour, Marine Ecosystems of the Azores, departing on the 13th of May. On this trip, you'll explore the delights of this Portuguese mid-Atlantic archipelago with marine biologists, you'll study whales and dolphins, and you'll visit basalt vineyards and volcanic lagoons. To find out more and to book your ticket, visit newscientist.com slash tours, or click the link in our show notes. Next up, we've got an incredible story on brain consciousness and entropy. And determining where in the brain consciousness arises is a long-standing mystery. And this week, our physics reporter Carmela wrote about a fascinating related finding. And so that finding is that our brains produce less entropy when we're asleep than when we're awake, uh, which is pretty incredible. <laughs> so Carmela, I think the best place to start with this story is perhaps with a little refresher on entropy. So remind us, what actually is it? Right. So let's forget about the brain for a second and just talk about entropy as a measure of disorder. You can think about a supermarket shelf. At the beginning of the day, everything's neatly and tightly arranged, so the entropy is low. There's no disorder. 
but then people come and they like grab different things and put them in the wrong place and you end up with a mess and now your entropy is very high. So when we talk about entropy production, we're really talking about processes that increase entropy or increase sort of the messiness and the disorder of something. So like messing up the shelf in the supermarket or breaking a coffee cup. And we also know that time in our universe moves forward as entropy increases. So you get this link between producing more entropy and the direction of time. A broken cup will not spontaneously reassemble itself, which would decrease its entropy unless you somehow make time run backwards. Okay, got it. So that's entropy. And how does that relate to brains? Are our brains producing disorder? And how would we even know that? Yeah, so it's it's a little rough to think about brains producing disorder, but I think the thing to think about here is what's happening inside the brain is that there's all this electricity, like electrical impulses are moving around and carrying and processing information. And we can say something about whether those processes have a fixed direction in time. So when we're conscious and we're thinking many things and seeing many things and hearing many things and our brain has all these stimuli coming in, you can imagine that running time backwards would change everything. So if the direction of time matters, then we must be producing entropy. The brain must be producing entropy. And the research that I reported on wasn't just about imagining what would happen. They actually did an experiment with a type of brain scan called functional magnetic resonance or fMRI to try and quantify this. Okay. So what did that experiment involve? Right. So the researchers started with fMRI scans of 15 people, and each person was scanned while they were awake or in three different stages of sleep, from sort of light and shallow sleep to very deep sleep. And what fMRI does is it records how blood flows around the brain. And the idea there is, of course, that if there's a lot of electrical activity in some part of the brain, then there's going to be more blood there to support it. So they made these measurements and then they had to make sense of them, and they used a mathematical model for you know how you should read fMRI data based on what we know about where in the brain electricity can travel or these electrical signals can move. So now they have data, they fit it to a model, and now they could calculate entropy production for each of the conditions. What they found is that for every person that they scanned, the amount of entropy that the brain was producing decreased as the person fell deeper and deeper into sleep. That's um, something quite soothing to think about as you fall asleep, uh, your entropy production (laughs) sort of decreases. Um, But what does this finding sort of really tell us about consciousness? Right. So this is one of these tricky things where where there's always a danger of of inferring too much from, from one set of data because consciousness is so complicated. But the research does... This research does actually give us sort of a a, a numerical quantifying tool for for what the difference is between being asleep and awake. You can calculate a number and that will tell you something about what level of of sleepy your brain is. And when I spoke to the researchers, they told me that their goal is really to use this fMRI procedure to study entry production of brains of people who are in a coma or have some condition that makes it difficult for them to communicate other than, you know, with eye movements or something very limited like that. So if you were to scan the brains of of these people and then get a number similar to what was calculated for entropy production of, of people who were awake during the fMRI, then we could infer that maybe in some of these conditions, people are actually more self-aware, more conscious than, than previously thought. So I wonder, did the experiment tell us anything at all about dreaming? Does that create more or less entropy? Yeah, so this is this is a little bit of a mystery here because the the data that they looked at in this study didn't really have anything about dreaming in there. So it wasn't part of their analysis. But I spoke to another scientist who told me that the kind of dreams we have in deep sleep are an altered state of consciousness, but a state of consciousness, and you would expect to see them do something in terms of information processing and entropy. So um, I think this sort of remains to be resolved. What, what does dreaming do to your brain? Now, Tim, there's been a bit of a breakthrough on understanding the causes of sunquakes, strange rumbles within the sun. Uh, What has the new study found? Yeah, so as our reporter Leah Crane wrote this week, sunquakes have been the subject that has divided solar physicists for decades. But a new study has found that sunquakes may actually come from beams of high-energy electrons that burrow through the outer layers of the sun. 
Wow, okay, so that, that's quite something to suddenly imagine. Um, let's start then, let's scroll back. What exactly is a sunquake? Yeah, so these are these are waves in the sun's photosphere, and that's the part of the sun that light radiates out from. And these waves, they ripple across the photosphere in a similar sort of way to when a pebble is tossed into a lake and you see those ripples. And these sunquakes, they are often associated with strong solar flares, and those are sort of powerful eruptions of energy that loop out of the sun's outermost layer called the corona. So these are sort of two phenomena in, in different layers of the sun. So do we know what the connection might be then between solar flares and sunquakes? Yeah, well, it's long been debated whether these flares could actually cause the quakes. As you say, they affect two different layers of the sun. So now researchers at Nanjing University in China, they re-examined um, 20 flares that occurred between 2008 and 2019. And 12 of them were particularly useful in that there was a lot of data from them and they co-occurred with sunquakes. So what did they find? So they found that 11 of these flares also coincided with blasts of X-rays. That hinted at the presence of high-energy electrons. And this was at a level far higher than you would see when solar flares occur in the absence of sunquakes. And so this all lends weight to the idea that it may be magnetic activity that is causing these particular flares and also creating beams of electrons that plunge into the sun's photosphere, causing sunquakes. That sounds very cool indeed. Um, does it sort of settle this big debate then? Uh, so unfortunately not. It's still not really clear exactly how the electrons would transfer their energy into the sun's plasma to cause a ripple. And we don't really know whether this explanation would apply to sunquakes that have been observed without strong X-rays. So it might be that sunquakes can be caused by several different mechanisms. So what we're going to need is some more observations to really untangle it all. OK, and are we likely to get those? Yes. Um, so there are currently several spacecraft observing the sun at the moment, and the new data they provide will hopefully solve this mystery. Now, this week saw the launch of a project called Polar Sounds, which is a collection of rarely heard underwater noises from the Arctic and Antarctic, put together by the Cities and Memories Project. Rowan has been chatting with the founder of Cities and Memories about the project and hearing all sorts of animals and human-made noises, and you can hear that in a bonus episode of the podcast out on Monday. But by way of a teaser, we wanted to play some clips that won't be on the bonus show. Uh, so here's a clip of a Weddell seal in Antarctica. So I, that's not what I was expecting at all. It sounded like outer space in a 60s movie. Sounds a bit yeah. like the clangers, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> so um, Weddell seals live close to the Antarctic ice shelf edge and they have a large vocal repertoire. And some of those sounds are thought to be produced by males to defend underwater territories. We've also got a clip of a crab eater seal. Oh, wow. You don't want one of those as a neighbour, do you? <laughs> it definitely sounds like a chainsaw or something, doesn't it? So the males in this species, they don't defend underwater territories, but they are thought to guard a single female on the ice until she's ready for mating. So I, I think that's, that's what we were hearing there. And as I said, there's lots more of this on the bonus episode, including some extraordinary and quite scary noises made by boats as they use seismic scanning of the seabed to look for oil reserves. And part of the project is having musicians use these underwater noises to make their own compositions. And you'll hear one of those two on the bonus episode. That's all for this week. So thanks to our guests, Madeline Cuff, Carmela padovic callahan and Matthew Sparks. And thanks to you all for listening. Don't forget to subscribe or follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. And do look out for next week's bonus special episode on Polar Sounds. Goodbye. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.